We are grateful, Heavenly Father, for support in every category of history. There never was a circumstance for which there was no support for the believer. We can say with David, we never saw a time when the righteous, those who had the imputed righteousness of God, were ever begging bread. We recognize that whatever it takes for us to advance to maturity, it has been provided by thee in eternity past. So we pause to express our gratitude for your faithfulness, for the fact that you are our refuge forever, and that underneath are the everlasting arms. So in obedience to the word, we have assembled ourselves together this morning to fulfill that purpose of growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, therefore, that God the Holy Spirit will enlighten us, for we ask it in Christ's name, amen. We have seen in verse 1, the first part of the verse, the divine perspective of life, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. We have seen to whom this is addressed, one to Philemon, one of Paul's converts, according to verse 19, probably led to the Lord by Paul in Ephesus. We have seen it's also addressed to his wife, Apphia, to his son, Archippus, who is the pastor of the Laodicean church, one of the three cities of the Lycus Valley, along with Colossae. We've also seen in verse 2 that uh, churches met in homes in the early world. Uh, they met uh, in private homes. This is sustained by other passages. We have seen the basis of Christian operation, grace, peace, prayer. Verses 5 through 7, we are now building up to the subject of the book, the personal testimony of Philemon. We have already seen in verse 5 that he has love and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, and this results in love and faith toward believers. His attitude toward Jesus Christ reflects itself in attitude toward other believers. In verse 6, we corrected the translation last time to read as follows, that the sharing of your faith might become energy or power in full knowledge of all the good that is ours in Christ. And we saw that the result of this translation, fellowship with other believers on the part of Philemon, is communicated and shared so that uh, the blessings of his life are shared so that others are in turn made strong and powerful and they develop a knowledge of the Lord through that communication. Verse 7, Paul is now approaching the subject of the epistle and of, and uh, it says in verse in Philemon 7, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the innermost life of the believers has been refreshed in the past with a result that it goes on being refreshed by the brother. He has a tremendous influence upon others for blessing. And now we come to the critical issue. Philemon is about to face a great crisis in his life. He a, has a tremendous testimony of grace. He lives by grace. He operates by grace. He has become a great blessing to others, but at this point, Onesimus, one of his slaves who ran away, stole his money and ran away, is returning. And this is the crisis in the life of Philemon, for how he receives his slave will determine whether he will continue to have a tremendous life of refreshing and blessing others, or whether from this point on he will revert to hypocrisy and therefore become a total flop by comparison with his previous experience. It is possible for believers to have a tremendous impact in the lives of others, no matter how humble their circumstances or what they are doing in life, and to lose that when they face the crisis apart from grace in their own experience. So behind this great life of impact is grace, and the love and faith of Philemon, which has reached into the lives of others, is now at the point of danger. For when Onesimus returns, if he receives him with any legalism, if he tries to punish him, if he tries to legislate on him in any way, he will not only destroy his own testimony, but he will destroy the budding Christian life of Onesimus. So in verses 8 through 12, we have the purpose of this letter. This is where we stopped last time. Verse 8. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to command thee that which is befitting. You see, it would be very easy for Paul to say, I hereby order you as 
the supreme dictator of all Christian forces resident on the face of the earth, that you receive back your slave Onesimus, that you forgive him, that, that you not lift a finger against him, and that you give him his freedom over and out. By order of the Lord Jesus Christ, signed Paul the Apostle. Now, he could have done that. But if he does it, he is guilty of two things. One, he is overprotecting one of his own spiritual children. And at times there is such a danger. Secondly, he is destroying the issue of volition in the Christian life. Every one of you as believers face the issue every day, the problem of do I choose to live the Christian life or do I choose to live a non-Christian life? Now you say, but I'm a Christian. What other way can I live? Who are you kidding? Most Christians do not live the Christian way of life. And being a Christian does not necessarily in any way imply that one will live the Christian way of life. The Christian way of life is a supernatural way of life. It is a way of life which is based upon doctrine. It is a way of life which is based upon the application of doctrine to experience. And most Christians are not living a Christian way of life. They are living in carnality and never doing anything about it from rebound on through. Therefore, there is a tremendous implication at this point in this passage, and this is the implication. The average Christian is not living the Christian way of life. Philemon is a picture of a believer who was living the Christian way of life. And when the average Christian lives the Christian way of life, he becomes a source of blessing to others. Your word refresh in the perfect tense. Refreshment in the past with the results that he continues to refresh others. And if your life is not a life of refreshment to others, then you can begin to suspect perhaps you are not living the Christian way of life, though you are a Christian. Now, once again, living the Christian way of life and being a Christian are not the same. My assumption is today that most of you are Christians, that you have personally received Christ as your Savior, that you are born again into the family of God. But whether you are living the Christian way of life or not is determined by only two factors. One knowledge, and two, volition. Do you choose the Christian way of life or not? And that is the crisis that Philemon must face. Now, let's get it down on the blackboard in black and white. The book, the title of the book is Philemon. Philemon is a wealthy Christian in the city of Colossae. The book of Colossians and Philemon were delivered together. They were delivered by a man by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus was a slave to Philemon. He stole his master's money and ran away. In the meantime, while Onesimus is dissipating that money and living it up in Rome, back in Colossae, Philemon is becoming a great source of blessing to all the Christians and other peoples in the Lycus Valley, which is made up of three great cities, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. These, this tremendous area has for spiritual leadership a man by the name of Philemon. He's a great believer at this point. But being a great believer today does not guarantee being a great believer tomorrow. You can be up today and down tomorrow. And whether you are up or down is determined by the crisis point in your life or in some cases a series of crises. And you must face these crises, which are experiences. For example, here is an experience. Onesimus is coming back to Philemon. And Philemon can meet him at the door and say, You dirty rat, wait till I get through with you. And then he could take him out and feed him half to death. And then he could put him on bread and water until he starved half to death. And then he can do this and that and the other thing, which is exactly what about... 75% of believers do right now. That's modus operandi for them. 
And if Philemon does that, he loses the tremendous power and impact of his life. This man is passing on power to others. This man is a source of tremendous spiritual refreshment to others. But listen, Christian, and this is an occupational hazard with believers when they get to the point where they think they know something about the Bible. That's a very dangerous point for some. A little knowledge is a wonderful thing, but a little knowledge is also a dangerous thing. And when you get to the place where you think you know the Bible as well as everybody else in the world, and a little better, there's a danger of pride creeping in. And when that pride creeps in, you may know a little something about the Bible, but your modus operandi is the antithesis of grace. And when you get to the place where you do not treat others in grace, and where you get so fat-headed that you think that uh, you are by yourself in the world, and no one can touch you when it comes to understanding the Word, then you're in trouble. Now, you see, Philemon's about to face that crisis. Philemon knows something about the Word. Philemon is growing up. And furthermore, Philemon at this point has a tremendous testimony, just as some of you today have a great testimony. But what's it going to be tomorrow? You see, the secret of the Christian way of life is to persist. Persist. Keep moving. Keep moving. When you fail, get up and move on. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving all the time. And most Christians won't get up and keep moving. They drift away from the Lord. They refuse to rebound. They refuse to recognize their condition. They walk right into legalism, and there they sit. And the worse and the more they become convicted of their sins, of legalism, and the problems that face them, the worse they become. And they even try to twist the knowledge that they have and rationalize it to make it say something else. Now, I know I'm right down where you live, because I know some of you too well. In fact, I know all of you too well. The reason I know you so well is because I read my Bible. You want to know what other people are doing? Read your Bible. Don't go around and gossip and bend your ear to Alexander Graham Bell and listen to all the dirt that's thrown around. Just get into the Bible and you'll get a full picture. Now, this has tremendous application. We get people who think, well, uh, I don't need the Bible anymore. I'll just come on Sunday. It's a drudge even to come there. I've heard all of that before. I know all of that. Let me tell you something. When you get to the place where it isn't as refreshing to you the 50th time that you heard it, there's something wrong. This is God's truth we're dealing with. So, Philemon, who has a tremendous testimony at this point, Philemon is on the line. And the point is, Philemon, what's going to happen to you now? You've got a man coming back, and this man, when he left, was an unbeliever. Now he is saved. Now he's born again. Now his sins are blotted out. Are you going to penalize him for his past sins when he's under the blood, when he's growing up now? Philemon, if you so much as try to penalize him for the past now and not leave it in the Lord's hands completely, if you do not open your arms to him, then Philemon, you're through in the Lycus Valley. Your great testimony is going right down the drain. And all of your gracious acts of refreshment, with which the first eight verses of this epistle are loaded, as we saw last time. Philemon, if that, if you treat Onesimus in any form of legalism, you've had it. Now, ordinarily, Onesimus would have a, a something coming to him. But Onesimus has trusted in Christ. And everything that he did before he was saved is blotted out. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, no longer remember the sins of Onesimus. He's under the blood of Christ. He has been cleansed. He who was a stealing slave is now a saved servant. And he comes back carrying the epistle to the Colossians, and he comes back carrying this personal letter. And we now face the crisis point, and Paul recognizes the crisis in verse 8 by saying, I could command you to forgive him. I could command you to take him in as a Christian brother. I could command you, I could order you to free him, and you would have to obey that because I am not only a five-star general, an apostle of Christ. I not only have the gift of spiritual dictatorship, which gives me the right and the authority to tell you to do this, 
but I am your spiritual father. I personally led you to Jesus Christ, and no matter how you slice it, if I tell you to do it, you must do it. But if he tells him to do it, he destroys volition in the Christian way of life. And you and I as Christians face the problem of verses 8 and 9 every day because volition is definitely a part of the Christian way of life, and every time you turn around, you get an opportunity to live the Christian way of life, or you get an opportunity to move into carnality. There are opportunities open to you every day, uh, opportunities to either choose the carnal way of life or the Christian way of life. And which way you choose determines your testimony in the future, determines uh, the ability to refresh and be a blessing to others. And none of you can be so deluded as to think that you are living here for self-gratification, that you are living here so that you, everyone can kowtow to you and, and please you, so that everyone can uh, uh, give you a great deal of attention. None of us could be so stupid as to think that. We are here for the Lord Jesus Christ. Our lives are here for a purpose. We are here to represent Him. We are here to honor Him. We are here to live for Him and not to please self and not to honor self and not to live for self. And therefore, whether we fulfill this or not is determined, just as it was for Philemon. Which way we choose today determines whether we have the ability to refresh someone else tomorrow or not. All right, now let's see what uh, the implication of verse 8 is, moving into verse 9. Instead of pulling my rank, Paul says, instead of calling myself, of, of saying, by order of the Lord Jesus Christ, signed Paul the Apostle, I'm going to come on another approach. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the ambassador. The word aged is literally ambassador. Paul the ambassador, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. What is Paul saying? He is saying, look here. I am speaking as a fellow soldier. I am taking my rank off my shoulder and off my collar. I am not pulling my rank on you. I'm talking as one believer to another. I'm talking as an ambassador to you. And I am saying that you, to, for your own sake, must use your own volition. If I use your volition for you, then I have destroyed the basis of you choosing tomorrow which way you should go. Now, do you see that? V is for volition. And in the last analysis, you must choose every day what, which way you are going to go. Whether you choose the Christian way of life or carnality depends upon you. And every day you face the opportunity of taking the carnal pipe, which brings you out here with a negative witness. Or you can take the Christian way of life pipe, which gives you a positive witness. So out here, there are going to be some results, and those results are determined on how you choose every day. And here is volition, and volition must choose. Now, if I order you to do this, then I have weakened your volition at this point, and I am not giving you the opportunity of choosing this way. But if you do it of yourself, by your own volition, in other words, if I order you, I destroy Operation Volition at that point. But if I appeal to you as one who led you to the Lord and as a fellow ambassador and you use your volition, then the positive results out here will glorify God. Because, remember, angels are watching and the basis of glorifying God after we accept Christ is dependent upon our ability day by day to choose. Why do I teach the Word of God and keep giving you the Word, the Word, the Word? Because the presentation of the Word gives you the ability, the knowledge, first of all, and the techniques whereby you are able to exercise your volition in a manner which will bring glory to God by choosing the Christian way of life. How can you choose the Christian way of life if you don't even know what it is? You can't, so you have to have knowledge, you have to have doctrine, you have to have the Word. And that's the point now. Verse 8 he says, I am not going to order you. And join means to command. Convenient at the end of verse 8 means that which is befitting. I can tell you the right thing to do. I can order you to do it. It's no good. Yet for love's sake, he appeals on the basis of love, 
I rather beseech thee as Paul, as such a one, as Paul the ambassador, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. He comes to the subject in verse 10. The purpose of the letter is revealed in verses 10 through 12. Onesimus is also Paul's spiritual child. Paul led Philemon to the Lord. Paul led Onesimus to the Lord. He led Onesimus to the Lord while he was a prisoner in Rome, and now he comes to the heart of the letter. I am writing this letter on behalf of Onesimus, and he doesn't call him your stealing slave, but he calls him my son. He calls him my son because he personally led him to the Lord. My son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Begotten is aorist tense. He is once and for all begotten. He is saved. He is born again. And now in verse 11, one of the most famous paranomasias in all of the history of literature, which in time past was to thee non-Onesimus. Onesimus means profitable. This word is a Greek word, and it means profitable. Now he says, this one, Onesimus, which is a rather a ironic name for one who stole money and ran away, but his name means profitable. But Paul says in the past he was non-Onesimus, and now he has become true Onesimus. That's verse 11. Which in time past was to thee, that is to Philemon, he was to thee non-Onesimus, but now he is Onesimus to thee and to me. Paul says he's been a blessing to me now. Verse 12 whom I have sent again, Paul is returning him to Colossae, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, as you would receive my own inner heart. Receive him, that is, my own inner heart. Now, what does he mean? He means, look here, if I were to come to Colossae today and to knock on your door, you would open your door and open your heart to me. And I want you to receive Onesimus back just as you would receive me were I to be in Colossae and to call on you today. You wouldn't be able to do enough for me. That's the attitude with which I want you to receive Onesimus. Now, notice he's, he's, this is advice. He's beseeching him. He's not ordering him. Verses 13 through 15. Well, what kind of a person is Philemon receiving back? That's the question answered in verses 13 through 15. Now he says, Whom I have retained, a reference to Onesimus. Whom I have retained, uh, and by the way, uh, this phrase, I have retained, is made up of two verbs in the Greek. One is the imperfect tense of the verb to wish, and the other is the present tense of the verb to hold back. He said, I am wishing to keep on holding back whom I have constantly wished in the past that I could keep holding back in the present. I'd like to hold him back with me. This is as strong as it could be because it, it involves two verbs. You see, it's so simple in the English. I would have retained. Now, I want to show you how pitiful a little English phrase like that can be. I would have retained. That's pretty soft and pretty easy. Now, the first verb here is to wish. It is in the imperfect. The second is to hold back, to keep, and it is in the present. So we have imperfect linear action start plus, plus present linear action start. You have two verbs combined, and it just stands out as if it had been underlined about 15 times. I keep, I kept wishing all of the time in the past since the day I met him that I could keep on retaining him in the present. It's just as strong as it can be. I kept wishing all the time in the past that I could keep on holding him back in Rome now. Why does he send him then if he wants to keep him? He sends him to put Philemon on the spot. Philemon, are you really going to live the Christian way of life or not? And just as Onesimus was sent back to Colossae from Rome, you and I face the same issue every day. Believer, are you going to live the Christian way of life or not? You know what it is now. Are you going to live it? Are you going to choose it 
when you have the opportunity. And every time you choose the Christian way of life, you glorify God before angels as well as before man. And every time you choose the carnal way of life, you do not glorify God before angels and men and do not fulfill the purpose for which you remain here. All right. Verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten once and for all in my bonds. I have wished constantly in the past that I could keep on holding him back now, he says, when he uses the word whom I have retained, verse 13, that in my stead, now he goes on to say, I was wishing to keep on holding him back with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered or served me in the bonds of the gospel. In other words, I wanted to keep him so badly so that he could serve me in your place. Now, what is Paul saying? It would have been very easy for me to rationalize. Paul's making a tremendous point to Philemon. Philemon, how easy it would be for me to rationalize and say, well, Philemon, if he was here, he would take care of me. If he were here, he would take care of me all of the time. He would just, he couldn't do enough for me. Philemon was that kind of a person. He was wealthy. He just couldn't do enough for Paul. Every time he was around Paul, he was trying to help him in some way. Now, he, Paul could sit back and rationalize and say, well, if Philemon were here, he'd help me all the time. And now Philemon isn't here, but all things work together for good. Here is his slave that I've led to the Lord, and he's such a tremendous help to me, I think I'll just keep him. Nothing would be worse. He, had, he kept him long enough to get him started. Paul kept him long enough to give him a complete follow-up course to give him basic training. Once Onesimus has basic training, he sends him back. For Onesimus and Philemon are both going to face a crisis. Now, I want you to see this. At this point, we have two crises. One, the crisis to Philemon. Will Philemon continue to operate on the basis of grace or not? Will he receive his, his slave back, forgive him and free him, and treat him as a brother in Christ? And also there's a crisis for Onesimus. Onesimus has had basic training now. He's a new believer, but he's moving along in the right direction. He's a great blessing to Paul. And the issue with him is, look here, suppose Philemon doesn't treat him right. Will he get his eyes on a man, or will he keep his eyes on the Lord? There are many, many, many believers who have been literally driven away in bitterness and confusion because of the legalism and tabooism of older believers, but not mature believers. Many Christians have been driven away because they got their, now they got their eyes on people, not condoning what they did, but recognizing what happened. They got their eyes on people, some legalistic, well-meaning, zealous, proud, vain, tabooy, tabooistic, ivory tower type of person comes along and says, don't, 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 to a new believer. They're confused. Sometimes they're bitter. Sometimes they're upset. Perhaps they haven't seen any true issues. They don't understand, rebound, the filling of the Spirit. They have no power. And this person comes along and gives them all of this business. And what do they do? They turn around and say, if that's Christianity, and if that's an illustration of Christianity, I'm true. And even though they are born again, never once do their lives count for the Lord. So Onesimus faces a problem, too. Will he be able to keep his eyes on the Lord? Will he be able to avoid the bitterness that comes to some believers when other believers maltreat them, malign them, run them down, or treat them in a critical, legalistic manner? Will he be able to or not? So the, both of them are facing a crisis. And just as both of these men from different walks of life face a crisis, so you and I face these crises every day as we have the opportunity by means of our free will to choose for God or against God, no longer in the matter of salvation, that's settled, but in the matter of the Christian way of life. Verse 13, then, we see how he would like to keep him and how he could have rationalized it. He could have said, well, this is, he's just going to minister in Philemon's stead. But he goes on in verse 14 to make another point. This is the testimony now of Onesimus. But without thy mind, literally without thy opinion, I would do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity. 
literally of compulsion, but willingly. And here is volition or free will operating in the Christian way of life. He says, I do not want you to do anything of compulsion. I want you to do that willingly or of free will, of volition. So volition is introduced at this particular point. And the crisis point has arrived for two men, Philemon, the wealthy Christian of Colossae, and Onesimus, his slave who stole from him and ran away and is now returning. And as I've already said, from the standpoint of Philemon, his influence in the Lycus Valley will come to a sudden end, and he will no longer have the ministry of refreshment if he operates on the basis of legalism now. If Philemon receives Onesimus as a sinner saved by grace, forgives him, restores him, and even frees him, then Philemon will emerge as one of the great spiritual giants of all time. As far as Onesimus is concerned, his continued growth and testimony are at stake. And to treat Onesimus and legalism will make him bitter and drive him away, just as many believers today are bitter and driven away by people who have been saved for a longer period of time but are not mature in the faith. Now verse 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldst receive him forever. Here's Romans 8.28. It's true that he stole money. It's true that he ran away. It's true that he has been a source of discomfort for you in time. But what is a little discomfort in time compared to the eternal salvation of a soul? Now he's got a new appeal. This time he wants Philemon to get the perspective, the value and the preciousness of a soul in the sight of the Lord. If only one person in all of history would have trusted in Christ, Christ would still have gone to the cross just for one person, one soul is precious and valuable in the sight of the Lord. And it's true that this has been a source of discomfort to you. It's true this has been a source of difficulty to you, Philemon. But, look here, Philemon, all things work together for good. Onesimus, in your house where there was plenty of provision, where everything was provided, he could never in those circumstances come to the end of himself and see himself in the perspective of sin, and the penalty of sin. And therefore, Onesimus had to steal. Onesimus had to run away. He had to live it up in Rome. Onesimus had to wake up one morning flat, broke with a hangover. He had to be down to the place where he was hungry. And he had to come around to me with a new perspective, eagerly and anxiously seeking something that would give him some stability for eternity. And here in Rome, he found Christ as Savior. He's born again. So in verse 15, perhaps therefore he departed. And what a wonderful way of expressing a slave stealing and run away, running away. He departed for a season that thou shouldst receive him or literally keep on having him. Present linear action start of the verb to have, that thou shouldst keep on having him forever. Verse 16, the attitude of grace is now expressed. Not now as a slave. The Greek says bond slave. But beyond, the word above is literally beyond, but beyond a bond slave, a brother, beloved. Beloved by whom? Who loves this slave Onesimus? Jesus Christ loves him. God the Father loves him. He has accepted in the beloved. He now has exactly the same position as his master Philemon. A slave, not no longer a slave, but beyond a slave, a brother, beloved, and then he adds, and especially to me, Paul, but how much more to thee. This is putting it right on the line. Both in the flesh, obviously Philemon didn't care for him in the flesh, so he puts in the flesh first. Every time Philemon thought of that rascal Onesimus, he got mad. Made him mad all over. Here's probably someone he trusted. He trusted him enough to get near him and, and steal his money. And every time he thought of that so-and-so stealing his money and the way I trust him and how he ran away, it just made him burn all over. He was tearing up his transmission every time someone mentioned Onesimus. <laughs> well, look how many times it's been mentioned now. <laughs> so you see, he's facing the crisis. 
So he says, you must love him in the flesh and in the Lord. Now, that's laying it on the line. Verse 17. If thou... Now, what an approach. And, and this is to, put, to, to give Philemon the perspective. If thou, Philemon, count me therefore a partner. If there's anyone in the world that Philemon would count a partner, it's the Apostle Paul who led him to the Lord. He has more respect and love for Paul than anyone else in the world. Paul led him to Christ. Paul is his spiritual father. Paul is the great blessing in his life. So, of course, he regards him as a partner. And so, if you regard me as your partner, receive him as myself. You receive him just as you would receive me. Now, that isn't going... And obviously, he wouldn't receive Paul uh, by whipping him, uh, by putting him to work, uh, by putting him in solitary for 30 days on bread and water and so on. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't try to take the money out of his hide. Receive him as myself. By the way, this is what Jesus Christ says to God the Father. Receive him as myself, because we are in Christ. Verse 18. If he hath wronged thee, first class condition, and he has wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, and he owes thee aught. If he's done this, and he has, now notice this. Oh, this is beautiful. Put it to my account. Charge it to my account. What kind of an account does Paul have with Onesimus? He has unlimited capital. As far as his credit is concerned, there's no limit to it. Why? Because he led him to the Lord. So he says, look here, if, uh, if he has uh, wronged thee, and he has, and if he owes thee anything, and he does owe him something, just charge it up to my account. That's a hint to forgive and to forget. For, forgive as Christ forgave. You see, Onesimus, or in the same vicinity as Philemon, is going to raise a problem. This will give Philemon a lot of time in the future to get mad. He may not get mad at me, he may get mad later on. But he is to forgive and to forget. Charge it to my account. Paul's credit is good with Philemon. And that's, by the way, a very delicate way of describing stealing, if he owes you anything, which he certainly does. All right, verse 19. This is Paul's promissory note. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay. However, he says, I do not say how, thou owest unto me even thine own self beside. Very interesting, isn't it? I'll be glad to repay. However, I would remind you that you owe me your very life. <laughs> you can see how, he's, how he is uh, referring this matter as Paul the ambassador and not Paul the five-star general. Philemon... You knucklehead, when that boy comes back, you just open your arms and take him in and forgive him and, and free him. Oh, no. Oh, no, he's not eliminating that. See, that's by order of the Lord Jesus, signed Paul the Apostle. Definitely not that. Instead, it's to be a matter of volition. It's to be a matter of grace. And by the way, Christian, Jesus Christ says to you, when you hold something against something else, someone else, just remember, I will repay, and I remind you, Christian, that you owe me your very life. Just a reminder, forgive as Christ forgave. You and I as Christians do not have the right under grace to hold anything against anyone. And if you bear any grudges or hatred or jealousy or sour grapes in your heart today, then you are so far out of line that it's pitiful. God help you if you don't get back in line. Rebound. First John 1, 9, and forget it. I hope I make myself clear. Verse 20. The continuation of Philemon's testimony. You see, we owe Christ everything. Christ, what did Christ forgive us? Everything. 
And our attitude toward others should be the same thing. Colossians 3.13. Verse 20 now, the continuation of Philemon's testimony. But now Paul takes a new turn again. He says, look here, I know you're going to make it, Philemon. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my inner life in the Lord. Now he says, you're going to refresh me. So here's the crisis point, Philemon. And Paul cannot have further joy and be stimulated by Philemon unless Philemon is gracious with Onesimus. So he says, how about refreshing me now? by receiving him back. This will give your life impact that it never had before. Having confidence in thy obedience. Paul hasn't commanded him, so this isn't obedience to Paul. This is obedience to the principle of grace specified by the Lord. Therefore, it is obedience to the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. When he says more, it means to free the slave. You will do more than I say. He's going to give, he's not only going to forgive on, uh, Onesimus, but he's going to give him his freedom. Verse 22. But withal, prepare me also a lodging. Now, this to me is the most beautiful part of the epistle in many ways, because it speaks of a refreshing experience which comes to believers at certain times. I think one of the most stimulating experiences in life is for believers to be gathered together after a great victory. And recognizing that the victory came from the Lord, the exhilaration, the refreshment. Have you ever seen an athletic team after a great victory? I'll never forget the hilarity uh, when Texas A&M uh, beat Texas University by one point when they were the great underdogs back in about 51. I was in the dressing room, uh, the A&M dressing room afterwards. And you never heard such whooping and hollering and exhilaration in all of your life. And everyone was just as exhilarated as it is humanly possible to be. They were all ecstatic. They were worn out, they were tired, they were bruised, and they were shot from the human standpoint, but you'd never know it. Why? They were refreshed. And why were they refreshed? Because of a great victory. And so it is with believers. There is no greater refreshment than Christian fellowship after a great victory, recognizing that the victory is the Lord's and rejoicing in it. So he says, Paul says, after this victory, I'm going to come see you. My, isn't that going to be a wonderful time when they get together? How wonderful it will be. And uh, you can uh, tell after you now to put the coffee on and uh, to get out whatever snacks she's making at the time. And we're just going to sit around and have a wonderful time. But with all, prepare me also a lodging. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given to you. In other words, I'm going to come back. And what a wonderful moment that will be, the sweetness of Christian fellowship which will come as a result of this victory. And many, many times when we face problems uh, as we are scattered throughout Houston and throughout the world, we face problems and difficulties and pressures, and by this volition, we take the Christian way of life pipe as over against the carnal pipe. And when we gather together then, having gone through a day or several days with a positive witness instead of a negative, how wonderful it is to come together with other believers, to have fellowship in the Word of God, to assemble ourselves. Some of you can even be exhilarated this morning because during the past week you faced crises in your life. And there was exhilaration. There is exhilaration now. There is blessing now. There is relaxation now. There is refreshment uh, from the Word because you face these things in such a wonderful manner. You face them by selecting the Christian way of life. You have come here today victorious. With others, you can't wait to get out of here today. And you've been miserable since you got in here. And you've been thinking about other things. And uh, you don't like the whole situation and you're just wondering if it would be necessary for you ever come back at all, and if you do, how uh, long can you wait before you come back? Can you delay a month, two months, or so on, or indefinitely? Will anyone notice? And so on. So these thoughts run through your mind. Why? Because you've been in carnality this week, because you haven't rebounded, because you're not moving, because you don't live under grace. You live under carnality. You are in bondage. And therefore, there is no refreshment in the Word. There is no refreshment in getting together with believers. Everywhere you look in this auditorium, you see people that to you are the worst stinkers in the world. 
You don't like anything about them. You don't like me up here. You just don't like the whole deal. That's the way you feel about it. Why? Because you're an unbeliever? No. Because you're living in carnality. Because habitually you choose the carnal way of life. And because you have a negative testimony, and therefore there's no refreshment, there's no response to the Word, there's no blessing. And if you were to get together with believers after the second service this morning, if you were to get together with believers tonight, it, you wouldn't enjoy it at all because you have no victories of the past week. You're not relaxed and refreshed by choosing the Christian way of life. And therefore, any time you get together with believers, it's a pain in the neck and you can't wait to get away. And that's the way it will be until you start making those decisions of positive volition of choosing the Christian way of life. And then you'll have verse 22 in your life. You will have fellowship with others. Prepare me a lodging. I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. And there salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. And then he mentions Mark, a great illustration of rebound. Aristarchus, Demas, who at this time is in fellowship and moving along. Luke, this is uh, the, uh, the physician. Luke, my fellow prisoners, these all salute you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. That last verse is the answer. Grace be with your spirit. The spirit is the inner part of man, the human spirit, whereby he is able to absorb divine phenomena. And you cannot absorb divine phenomena apart from the perspective of grace. Now, Father, we're grateful for all that thou hast provided for us in Christ Jesus. We thank thee that by the grace of God we are what we are, and that his grace is sufficient for every need and more so. And therefore we recognize that thou hast done exceedingly abundantly above all that we ever ask or think. And we know that concerning Christ, of him and to him and through him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. And so, Father, our prayer and heart's desire is that these things which we have examined so briefly with regard to Philemon, with regard to Onesimus, might be applied to our lives and experiences, that we might have the joy of a positive witness of becoming a means of refreshment in the life of others, and that as a result of our positive witness and as a result of our refreshment to others, <clears throat> we might have the privilege of leading souls to Christ and have a great harvest in eternity because of thy grace. We thank thee for much more grace then. In Jesus' name, amen.